So last time uh, we ch spent some time chatting about this idea that if we're interested in two things. Uh, we're interested in, the first, if you spill something which doesn't mix with water, immiscible, then its motion in the subsurface is really driven primarily by gravity. So it matters whether it's lighter than water or denser than water. Uh, if it's lighter than water, it'll sit on top of the water table, uh, be buoyed by it, even though it's a porous medium, it's just like being a swimming pool. And if it's denser than water, it'll try and go across the water table, which is what we have here. And in its transit down, it will take this kind of interesting pathway, and the pathway will be controlled by what we said yesterday, last time, on um, Thursday, is the track of the most open pore space because that has less resistance to entry uh, and uh, expulsion or resistance to entry by uh, interfacial uh, pressures. Gravity is really the only force, bless you, that's driving the, the flow, uh, ver largely vertical flow. And the reason that it gets segregated in these areas is that some, in some cases it will pond uh, on top of low permeability strata, and then it will reach a capacity like sitting on a saucer, in which case it spills off the sides and causes these features where the dark red is really what we would call high saturations uh, of the fluid in a pore space, filling up all the pore space, kicking out the water that was there. And the pinky, uh, lighter red stuff is um, at lower, what we call lower saturations. So we're interested in understanding exactly how this architecture will evolve. If we have a lot of stuff going to the subsurface, as in this case, where it's stratified, a lot of stuff going in the subsurface where it's not stratified uh, because there are none of these little uh, barriers, but it reaches this aquitard, which is a quote-unquote Capley barrier, and where we have spills of less amount, where it's the volume of it gets eaten up in the chimneys, the partly saturated chimneys it makes, uh, and also the puddles it makes, and it may not get all the way down to the base. And if it's finely stratified with lots of different regions where you have differing permeability between these layers, but really uh, pore space sizes or pore throat sizes, then it will form this kind of stair step uh, structure, which is quite complicated. And so what we might like to do is be able to figure out exactly what the distribution would be if we're going to try and remove it, because that would be something useful that we would have to understand. One, if you drill a hole through this and you see only patchy uh, collections of this, what will happen to this? Well, what would you think would happen is that if you drill a hole through this, it just jumps in the hole and goes all the way to, to the bottom of the hole. So you think that you had this stuff sitting in the bottom of the hole, which is not true. And so we have to be un, un, uh, able to accommodate our understanding of exactly what the controls are on the system. And so the controls that we talked about last time was that it's controlled by capillarity. I'm just going to do some drawing for a while. This is probably slightly... And we made the case, as you probably recall, that we could have these capillary tubes that would represent behavior. Or we could represent a fracture that would give us similar behavior, in which case the height rise that would occur from the base of these was something we've referred to as H sub C. Let me push this back a little bit. And in both of these cases, where this was the diameter of the tube or this was the width of the fracture. And we come up, came up with some relationship by doing this force balance thing that the height rise was equal to, uh, I think, four times the interfacial tension divided by the diameter and the unit weight of this wetting fluid. Uh, or in the case of this fracture, I think it was equal to two times the interfacial tension divided by the aperture between these two plates multiplied by uh, the unit weight of the fluid. Uh, 
And we made the case that we could also represent this as what we call a capillary pressure. which we will define, which we did define, as the difference between the pressure in the non-wetting fluid and the wetting fluid, which actually is equal to this value Hc times the unit weight of the fluid. In other words, this column. And so this is a generic term. I guess this is this term is what we would call Pc0, and we'll return to this. And that is that if you think of this as a column, that we now take a tube. So we have this tube that's sitting here. And we have this column, which is of height h sub c. And we've just removed this stuff at the base and cut it off. Then physically what this means, in a physical, and you can get this in a physical sense, if we added some more fluid to this, so that now the height was some height larger than this by delta H, then at this top part we'd have the same forces acting as before, but now the column, the total column height would be HC plus delta H, which is bigger than HC. And this HC, well, we should call it HC zero probably, is the height that you can support by surface tension. If you get more than that, it's just going to break away and go down. And so that's an important component in trying to understand exactly when the stuff within this column is going to sit there happily. But if you add some more to the height of it, then all of a sudden it can't hold itself anymore and it's going to scoot down. And we'll see a little further on that the controls of it scooting down are that if there's nothing to stop it from going, it'll just keep on going. And so that is why we end up with these architectures that look like this, where it's ultimately stopped by some barrier. So the other thing in this is that we'd like to be able to make this distinction that when we look at these systems, we could take, for instance, um, a box completely contained in this pink zone, if you can see that. Or we could take a box which is completely contained within this red zone. And we'd like to calculate the saturation. And the saturation we can define as the volume of a particular fluid relative to the total void volume. I'd use a cross through the Vs just to, for volume rather than velocity. And that's useful because it would allow us to be able to say how much of this, in a quantitative manner, how much of this prod component, I, is in the system that we'd like to get out of it. And I kind of rushed through this last time and didn't do these definitions, but let's go back to them. And let's define um, saturation. Because so far, right now, we've talked about capillary tubes and fractures. Uh, and of course, we could put together a series of capillary tubes to represent a porous medium where all the, the diameters of the tubes are different. But we'll do that in a second. But our interest is in being able to figure out exactly, for instance, how much of the red fluid is present within this box. And one way to do that would be to calculate it based on this idea here. So we have a porous medium, which are these grains. We talked last time about the fact that for these grains, we would have some uh, wetting fluid, which would fill up the portion. This little red stuff, we called this pendular saturation, I think, last time. And so, um, if I do this, the blue is the grains, uh, the red is the wetting fluid, and the white is the non-wetting fluid. You can imagine that we could put a box around this. Whoops. Uh, 
didn't realize I was such a fantastic artist. Artiste. A piss, a piss artiste. And in that box we could do a couple of things. Imagine we could centrifuge it. And we could centrifuge it so that we could divide it into a couple of main components. I won't do these as wide as it is. But these are the two components. One would be um, the solid, which I'll call Vs, and the voids, which I'll call Vv. And this total thing is the total. And so this is all by way of us being able to define a couple of things. We can define uh, porosity, which you must have seen in your careers before, which we'll call n in this class, which is the volume of the voids divided by the total volume. We can define the saturation by doing a slightly different box, just in the volume of voids. And this box is the red fluid, which will be if I can do it here, the volume of the wetting fluid. And the white would be the volume of the non-wetting fluid. You can also draw a line for that, if you can see that. Yeah, it's quite big, isn't it? So you can see it. And we can define the saturation as S as being equal to and of course, this whole height here is the volume of the voids, the void space. So the saturation is the volume of the wetting fluid divided by the volume of the voids. Again, just applying through it, just by definition. Or it could also be, this would be the saturation of water. The saturation of the non-wetting fluid would just be the volume of that non-wetting fluid divided by the same volume of the voids. And if I zoom back out again a little bit, then our reason for doing that is that we could calculate the mass of the non-wetting fluid is just equal to the total volume of your aquifer multiplied by uh, the porosity, multiplied by the saturation, multiplied by the density of the non-wetting fluid. And we can show that that's true just by taking these individual components, taking the total volume, multiplying it by the porosity, which is this term. So this is the volume of the non-wetting fluid divided by the total volume. The saturation is going to be the non volume of the non-wetting, sorry. Oh, sorry, that, this is incorrect, right? Just, just uh, you need to modify this by definition. Um, this is the volume of the voids divided by the total volume. The saturation is equal to the volume of the non-wetting fluid divided by the volume of the voids and multiplied by the density of non-wetting fluid. And so if you take this and get rid of this and you get rid of this, then the mass of that particular non-wetting fluid is just the product of the volume of the non-wetting fluid times its density. So by definition. So it's important for us to be able to define these components. So we can define saturation as exactly that. And that's a term that we'll use throughout this class. And so the reason for us wanting to do that is that when we come back to look at these little the boxes here, I know I've gone off it, is that it's more convenient for us to define a volume of the aquifer that has a particular saturation. We don't really care what the distribution of that stuff is because we kind of centrifuged it down, but we would like to know how much we have in there because, for instance, if we sucked it out just by dissolving it, and we know how much we suck out dissolved in water per unit time, we could calculate how long it would take us to suck it all out. Decades, probably. And so that would be something useful that we could get from this. 
And so our reason for talking about this is that today what we'd like to do is take our concepts a little further than we had last time. Before, what we said is that if we have an aquifer that we think of as this little capillary tube, we could figure out exactly how much this column height would be uh, before uh, as it was stable and how much we could add to it that would make it unstable. And that would be one model of the aquifer. But we also talked about the fact that maybe our aquifers aren't just single capillary tubes, but maybe they're arrangements of capillary tubes and they have some heterogeneity, heterogeneity attached to them. Yes, shout. Yep. Can you zoom into the uh, undersaturation? Okay. So, so yeah. yeah, no, I'll get What does that say in the, in the last box? This one here. Uh, uh, no, box saying, here. Yeah, yeah. This is volume non wetting, non volume wetting. That's. I was going to say look at the video, but of course you wouldn't be any the wiser because I didn't uh, define it. Okay, and so we made the point last time that it matters whether the, ch the the aquifer that we have looks like this or like this. If we have lots of different diameter pipes in it, it matters whether they're in parallel or in series. In series, then you'd expect it to get hung up on the smallest one, and this height here could be really high, and you'd never get over it. In this case, it would just automatically go down the biggest one, and it would be down at the bottom of the aquifer very early. So the architecture of these pipes makes a difference. And so rather than look at these idealized models of exactly what these would look like, what we could do is we could take real porous media, and we could do an experiment on it to see exactly what this behavior would be as we try and saturate it. Okay, so that's what we're going to do today. So I need to go back out of here. If I don't look up and I'm chatting away, shout as you did, or shout louder. Uh, and so this is kind of our plan for today. Recap we just had. We will talk about what we refer to as capillary pressure versus saturation curves. Um, and they come in a variety of flavors doesn't really matter uh, for now. All of this stuff here that we'll talk about are really these curves. But it's easiest for us to talk maybe in a physical sense about how we might figure out exactly what those <laughs> curves are. Actually, I think it'll be your second assignment. And so it's useful to, for us to do it. And so I think I have to go not into this section, but into this section here to make the point that the apparatus we use looks a bit like this, which I will make quite large. So this is what's referred to as a Welge apparatus. You can see the title at the bottom. It doesn't really matter what it's called. And it's probably worthwhile reiterating the fact that when we're looking at the, the motion of these fluids in the subsurface, nothing we've done has said anything about how quickly they'll move. It says only something about the equilibrium situation. And so what this, uh, and this will only tell us the equilibrium situation as well, we're balancing forces. So you take a sample of your aquifer, and you place it in this uh, system, it's just a piece of core. Uh, it sits on a frit, which doesn't allow oil to go across this frit. And so you take this core, you put it in a container, and you fill it up with oil all around it, a non-wetting fluid. So it's a wetting fluid in here. It's filled with water, saturated with water. It's a non-wetting oil around it. You put a rubber stopper, a rubber bung above it, uh, that allows you to be able to uh, completely fill this with oil and then apply on this some kind of pressure, usually driven by nitrogen. So you can pressurize the oil. So initially, because of capri forces, the oil will not invade into the, the porous medium. And uh, so nothing will happen in the system. If you increase the pressure, then what you'd expect is that the pressure in this stippled fluid increases, and it will try and invade this sample. If it invades this sample by mass balance, some oil goes in, 
the water is incompressible, the water has to go somewhere. The only place it can go is out into this brine. It is brine because it's an oil field here. And if it goes into here, the volume in this U-tube will come up, and this will rise by some amount delta H, which, rep which we won't call delta H because it's really only the volume change that we're interested in. So we increase the pressure a small amount. We'll invade this uh, by taking it, and if you, you would look at the shape of the core, maybe what you'd see would be that the core would do something like some of this oil would go in and fill up some of the pore space. So we know now that within this cube, originally it was 100% saturated by water. Now it's 99.9% .9 saturated by water and 0.1% saturated by oil. And so what we could do is we could, by measuring this volume change, we know exactly how much of the, the fluid is in here. And so we, and we know what the pressure is that we're applying relative to the zero pressure that was originally in the system. So what we could do is we could draw a diagram. And I'm going to shrink this down so I can draw the diagram here on the side. And this diagram will be exactly what we're going to call our capillary pressure versus saturation diagram. And it will look like this. And on the bottom, it will have water saturation. which is between 0 and 1, or 100 percent, which would be the same as oil saturation, which we'll call SNW, and we've already called this SW. And this will vary between 0 and 100 percent, the other, other direction. I guess we, we use the decimal could use it as a percentage or as a decimal, not 10, but 1. And we should look at what we've done. So we started off at 0, and on the vertical, we have what we'll call capri pressure. Uh, I can't write on my side very well, but I'll write it here. Which we'll call PC. And so we start off with zero capillary pressure. The saturation of oil in the system is zero, and so we're here. We increase the capillary pressure some a small amount. Until we get to an amount that's big enough to actually push some in, then there is no saturation of stuff in here. At some magical capillary pressure, which we'll call PC0, all of a sudden we break just into this graph here. And we'll be at this point. So we basically come up here. We hold it at this magnitude, and we see it drifts into here. Do nothing. So now we go back again. We increase the pressure and the nitrogen pushing the oil in. And we go up some small amount. And we'd expect the saturation to change some small amount to an equilibrium amount here. We do it again. We wait, and it slowly invades whoops, sorry, to get to another point. And you get the, the idea that we end up with a, a diagram that starts looking like this. So these individual points here represent data points, equilibrium data points. And so by the time we get to this point here, I suppose our sample would be looking like um, these have got to be very large. They've expanded. There have been new ones started from the edge, and it's looking like it's some kind of weird creation. And what we're interested in here is being able to join those dots. This dot here. And I won't be able to join them very well, but you will get to see this comes up here. And it goes across here, and it will start doing this. And we could keep on doing this, so we could do this again. Whoops. Can draw a straight line up to here and across. And then if we decrement it, if we come down, 
then what we'd find out is that we again reached some new equilibrium points. And I'll just keep doing the blue for a couple of these so you see exactly where it's going. And it will make my point perfectly that on these downward ones, I'll do it in a different color, it will come back down from, whoops, back down from here, whoops. Not a very steady hand, but you get the idea. And so the red and the fuchsia, or is it magenta, I'm not sure which, these two colors represent capillary pressure versus saturation curves. And so what they are is they're a surrogate, if you like, to the very simple views that we've had so far in looking at these tubes. So we said before that the capillary tube represents what's going on quite nicely. Um, the height of rise within the capillary tube is analogous to the amount of this fluid that can be held in the pores and will just be held there. If you add an extra height to it, then that's too much for it to sustain and it will move. And so physically, uh, what you can think of it, instead of being driven by gravity, you could think about pushing something into the side of this core. And the side of this core might look like a couple of grains that are this. I think we used this before. Unfortunately, I've changed. And if you imagine taking a bubble of oil, and if you apply a pressure on this side against it to push it in this direction, this is the pressure that will squeeze it through this gap so it gets to the other side. So sometimes this location here, uh, we'll call it PC0. Uh, sometimes it's called the bubbling pressure. Uh, actually, in a different way from bubbling as in boiling, but pushing it into the system. Or sometimes it's called the entry pressure for obvious reasons. And this is the same as what we called before HC0 multiplied by the unit weight of the fluid. And so this is an important order. So our models of these capillaries that we talked about a little earlier really only gives us one point. It says what this threshold is when we begin to get invasion of this porous medium at zero saturation, right? Zero saturation of the invading non-wetting fluid. 100% saturation of water that's already present in the system. And as we keep on raising the pressure, we'll progressively invade at higher and higher saturations until we reach a point that we can't invade anymore. And so that's really indicative of the fact that the pore space that's holding the water doesn't want to give up. It wants to stay there and doesn't want any more of this invading fluid to get into the system. But then when we back off the pressure, on the outside, then it would give up the oil, and the oil would come back out of the system at the expense of water. So that at any particular pressure that we're interested in, if we're at this pressure here, whoops, I keep on saying whoops because I draw these straight lines, I like them to be straight. At this pressure here, the equilibrium saturation would be this magnitude here. This would be the amount. This would be the amount of water that's present within the system. And this would be the amount of the non-wetting fluid that's in the system. You're so quiet, I could hear you sipping your, is it tea? Or gin? So, so that's what we're after. So this gives us much more information, right? It doesn't just say when we'll invade it. Uh, which is a, a very useful property to know, but it also tells us uh, any particular pressure that we have in our system, what the saturation would be, the proportions of water, and the, the proportions of the other component. And of course, we didn't say it, but the saturation of the wetting fluid uh, 
plus the saturation of the non-wetting fluid have to add up to 1, right? By the fact that we these two things add together. So, so that's probably a useful way to explain it. So we brought forward the apparatus to be able to make those points, but that's basically what a capillary pressure versus saturation curve looks like. And so that will zip back to this. So we skipped, as we said, to this to say exactly what that was. Um, and now, so let's talk about some nuances of what the features are of these different capillary pressure versus saturation curves, which we've just introduced. And we can use the work of a couple of, a few other people before us, uh, Leverett and Brooks Corey, to be able to say something about the features of those. Talk about pushing, draining water out of the system or imbibing water into the system and what the role of these different non-aqueous fluids going into it would be. And of course, the other thing, you know, to, to make the punchline here is we've said that in these capillary pressure versus saturation curves, uh, oh, must be too, too big. Uh, we know that if we have the pressure, capillary pressure at a particular point, we could calculate what the saturation is. Well, we kind of know what the pressures would be in this system because we know, and I know you never thought you'd ever use this again, we know that the pressure at this point is going to be equal to the unit weight of water multiplied by the depth of that point below the water table. And so we kind of know what the pressure is, so we just need to be able to convert that into what we'll define as a capillary pressure. Don't need to worry about that now. It's quite straightforward. And if we can do that, then we know what the pressure, capillary pressure is at that point. We immediately know what the saturation is. And we immediately know exactly how much mass of that component would be present within the subsurface. So hopefully they're, they're useful things. Let's look at the features of this. So I'll get rid of this. I'll make it larger. We, um, we've talked about the idea before um, that we can define things in using dimensional analysis. So something like Buckingham Pi theorem allows us to define non-dimensional variables which explain systems. They're very powerful because it doesn't matter whether you're using SI units or imperial units. The, the, cur the, the formulae you get should be unique. You shouldn't have to define dimensions to them. Um, and if you do that, you can also use it to kind of limit your system to a minimum number of variables that control behavior. And so we've just drawn some curves that you've seen, which we've called capillary pressure versus saturation curves. My bad uh, drawing made the curves much less, uh, very different from this. But you can see the main features that if you, for instance, look at capillary pressure, then you could, on this axis, have a capillary pressure between zero and some big number. The units, if we're using um, SI units, would be in pascals, I suppose. Not I suppose, they would be. And we could imagine what pressure we'd apply to that core to be able to make this graph. We know that when we came up to whatever this pressure is, not 0 0.3, but whatever this pressure would be, then we'd get invasion and we get progressively more oil in the system so that at this point here and at this point here and at this point here, if we call them A, B, and C, then if we went back to this graph here, then I haven't erased my stuff from last time. Um, this is the initial aquifer. White is water, so this isn't quite 100% saturation. Let me just draw a cameo of this figure that, we, that I just put on. This is capillary pressure, this is saturation of water, and this is this curve. This was A. This was B, and this was C. 
So where do they exist on these um, schematics, on these cartoons? 100% saturation of water. Uh, this is not quite this, so I guess this would be maybe A prime. You push more oil into the system. Um, in this particular case, this is B. And if you push even more oil, so there's as much oil in there as you can get, then that's basically C. Remember that the water was the white stuff. It's this, what we call pendular saturation. Grain on grain, a donut around the contact, and also underneath the contact, but many, most of the volume is in this ring around the contact, the donut. And so this is no longer connected to the inlet, so you can't physically it's completely isolated and so you can't get any more water in if you push more oil into the system you're left with this irreducible saturation likewise uh, when we come back down this and I'm making this a bit more complicated than perhaps it needs to be if we came on this other curve which was the other one that we had down here then this point at the bottom which I'm going to call D would also kind of be this, right? We forced as much water back into the system as we can. We're left with these little bubbles of oil which we can't get out. So the oil is present at this relatively small saturation of the oil, which would be this amount here, right? This would be the saturation of the non-wetting fluid. And this would be the saturation of the wetting fluid. They add to one together. And this is the geometry. So this is a, f a figure that just represents that, that geometry. And it's important for us to be able to understand what's going on in these conditions. Okay? So I go back to that, try and find the lever curve. So I made the point that we can define these behaviors. So it's, it's important for us to define them. What color are we? Let's see, I don't want to be blue. I want to be red. And so we can define some properties. This we'll refer to as, we've called it the bubbling pressure. Or the entry pressure. Or we've also called it PC0. The capillary pressure at zero saturation. We haven't defined this, but this uh, boundary here we'll refer to as the irreducible saturation of water. Irreducible. Of the wetting fluid, usually water. So in other words, if push as we can, we can't get any more non-aqueous, uh, non-wetting fluid into the system. This will always remain the portion that's water wet in our system. And the other one is this irreducible saturation of the non-wetting. So this is irreducible saturation of the non-wetting. And so this is when we have bubbles, bubbles of black oil within the pore space. And we'll call this S non-wetting zero. We'll call this saturation of the wetting irreducible. Um, and it's important to realize that at this very low pressure that we had before, so in other words, if we have zero pressure applied to this, we could potentially be in two states. And that's why when I drew on the cartoon before, A prime, which was, well, actually A, which could be here, and D actually looked exactly the same, kind of, because we didn't have one that was pristine. This would suggest that it's all water, but it's not. At this stage, if it's gone through this cycle, it will actually have some of this uh, non-wetting fluid in the system. So that's that.
uh, and the other thing that we can define, we'll do it later, is we can define um, an imbibition curve, a drying curve, which is this curve, and an imbibition curve, which is this one. Imbibition because it's imbibing, same as drinking, uh, spontaneously imbibing the wetting fluid, which is water. So in other words, you take the pressure off, it will preferentially, because it's hydrophilic, uh, loves water, it'll suck that component back in. So, so that's the first lesson to have in this. Um, the other point, I'll remove those because it's getting kind of crowded. Wow, I love it. I heard the little sigh of delight you had collectively in the class as I did that. I know you just enjoy that as much as I do. <laughs> so the other thing was, which I kind of deviated from, was this idea of non-dimensional parameters. So if you physically think about what the controls are in the system, you could do a Buckingham Pi analysis, uh, and you could break this down not into something that defined Capri pressure on this axis, but that defined a non-dimensional property which was equivalent to Capri pressure. And so this J function, we could think of as kind of an, a non-dimensional pressure. And it stems from the fact that if you think of a, a Capri tube as being something that would represent this Capri behavior, the height rise in the system, uh, then we could define the Capri behavior based on that um, physical simplification. You could also take the same bundle of capillaries and you could push fluid along those as pipes and you could from that using the pipe equations, Moody charts, 64 over RE for the friction factor, etc. You could calculate what the equivalent hydraulic conductivity or permeability would be for that pipe as well. And so if you have a permeability for that particular diameter pipe and you also have its capillary characteristics, then for the same diameter pipe, you could look at that capillary characteristic and permeability, and you could link them through the pipe diameter. And it might not be strange that you could link capillary behavior with permeability. So that's the, the leap of faith. Maybe we'll do it as we go further down the class, because we'll talk about capillary models for permeability. But the bottom line is that what we could do is we could replace some kind of dimensionless, non-dimensional uh, pressure, capillary pressure, by a function. A function that is the actual capillary pressure, the interfacial tension, multiplied by the square root of permeability, and the porosity. Um, we know that this is, has to be a non-dimensional number. We know that the units of this would be newtons per meter squared for capillary pressure. Um, interfacial tension is newtons per meter because it's around a circumference of a tube. Permeability is in meters squared and porosity has no dimensions. And so hopefully if we do this, square root meters times meters gives us meters squared over newtons times newtons per meter squared. And so indeed the units of this are null. There are no units. And so what is important about this is it allows us to draw this capillary pressure diagram uh, for any rock that we want to, albeit in an idealized sense, and it has some important ordinates on it. One is that the, the, the J function when we get invasion doesn't work anymore. <laughs> That's a bizarre deal. Well, well, necessity's a mother of invention. So J0, you're not going to like this. Uh, let me just uh, turn this off and reboot it, see if that's the problem. It works on Bluetooth. So maybe it lost the Bluetooth connection. <laughs> 
I don't want to disconnect. I guess I could try. Oh, it's not turned on. That's why it's not working. Yeah. No, it's done. No, that's kind of curious. Oh, well, we'll soldier on. I didn't mean to do that. So what we could do is we could take this value for j0, and we know that this value is always equal to 0 0.3. <laughs> and so if we know this value is j0, uh, 0 0.3, typically we can get the permeability of a porous medium very easily. We just run a, a test in the lab. It's very difficult to get the capillary characteristics. But we can measure this very easily. Porosity, we can measure, typically between 0.1 and 0.3. The um, capillary pressure, we don't know, but we do know the interfacial tension of whatever this invading fluid is in this particular medium, uh, typically. And so we know the value of J is equal to 0.3. The only parameter we don't know is this. So we calculate what the capillary pressure PC0 would be that would get us entry. If we know what PC0 is, uh, we, if we can calculate a numerical value of that, we know that's also interest equal to HC0 multiplied by the unit weight of the non-wetting fluid. <laughs> this is slowing me down. Uh, and so we could calculate what this column height would be that would be stable. And if we go above that, no longer it would be stable, and it would scoot down through our porous medium. And so it's an important parameter for us to be able to, to define. And we can look at uh, different variants on this. You can see that this value is controlled by um, the fact that we might have an interface angle. But that's, the upper limit on this cosine theta would be 1. And so we probably don't care too much about that. And so this graph is quite important to us. It, it includes each of the features we had before in terms of an entry pressure, an irreducible saturation that occurs at 0.87 saturation of water, and an irreducible saturation of water that's about 10%. And we can look at some real ones in a minute. And so that allows us to actually quantify exactly what this behavior is. Let's skip this and go somewhere else. Um, the other thing that it allows us to do, if we go back to this, is to define these components in the different mode. So this is the entry pressure that we have where we will start invading by a bubble of the oil will get into our core. This is the irreducible saturation that we talked about before, which is this boundary, which is where this curve hits the... Um, zero pressure intercept. This is capillary pressure. Sometimes it's easier to think of it in terms of capillary pressure. And we have these behaviors which are drainage of the water out of the system. So as we're going up this curve here, we're draining water because we're going across and reducing the saturation of water. So it's referred to as the drainage curve. We get up to the top and then we back off the pressure and come back down here. Then we come down the curve again, but instead of retracing ourselves along this curve, because of hysteresis, this idea that if you have a, a raindrop on a windshield, that the contact angle at the front, where it hasn't yet wetted the, the windshield, is different from the contact angle at the back, where the tail is dragging behind, where it's previously been wetted, as it's coming down in the rivulet on the windshield means this hysteresis is represented in the porous medium by this. This was previously uh, pristine and not wetted, and now this has been uh, wetted by the oil, and it has new characteristics as it now re-wets to go across it. So this would be like the pristine uh, wetting that isn't the tail anymore. If we stopped the, the imbibition process, it's referred to as imbibition because here as you come down here, it's getting less oil, and it's imbibing water in from the sides. 
So it's water is draining or water is imbibing. If we stopped here and we increased the pressure again, then we wouldn't go back up this curve, but we'd go back up what are referred to as scanning curves. And so we get back onto this part here and then continue our way up here. So it's quite complicated. It's really just driven by this idea of hysteresis, by the tail of the drop versus the front of the drop. And I suppose the ramifications are, uh, the slightly complicating factor is, that if you have a single particular capillary pressure, I didn't mean to draw it there, I'll draw it separate. Oh, yeah, she actually could be here. A single capillary pressure that goes, which is one atmosphere uh, gauge pressure. This is zero atmosphere gauge. So the issue is that if you had this pr pressure, you potentially have a whole bunch of different saturations that you could choose from. Two major ones, which are the limiting ones on either side of this curve, and a whole series of ones in the scanning. You don't know where you are unless you know what the history is. And typically we don't know what that history is. But at least we have an understanding of why this behavior is like this. And also we can limit the saturations where we would be to within 20%, I suppose, maybe 15% in this. And so those are the important characteristics of this. Okay? So capillary pressure curves are important to us. Irreducible saturation of the non-wetting fluid, irreducible saturation of the wetting fluid, entry pressure, drainage curves when you're draining water, imbibition curves where you're imbibing water, and scanning curves when you change direction of your pressure changes. And so you just had to have a, a, a feel for what those are. And, and this is really predicated on this, the hysteresis results from this. Um, what else? We made the case that if we look at these so-called Leverett curves, or this Leverett function, that we should only have one particular curve. But that's really only if we have one diameter of capri tube that describes our behavior. If we have small ones and wide ones all together, then we'd expect that we might not have such a simple curve as this. And actually, this curve in this format, we can't get from the capri tubes, right? Remember we said that we can only get one parameter from the capri tubes, and that is that this wetting um, uh, bubbling pressure or entry pressure is at this particular location. We can't get the form of this curve. The way we get the form of this curve is by, well, I can't uh, draw it, is by uh, drawing two spheres in contact with each other and looking at what the form of the contact would be as we increase this from a low saturation to a larger saturation and presumably from the shape of this meniscus we can get the capillary pressure and if we have the capillary pressure from the shape of the meniscus and we have the volume of the meniscus we can get saturation. So presumably the rest of this curve here we can get from the growing shape of this sphere on sphere grain plus the waste extent of the, the fluids. And so we need to be able to, to use that simplification to get that. And so if we had a system where we have a whole bunch of different pore throat diameters, you'd expect that the capillary pressure versus saturation curve would get for a whole bunch of different famous um, oil reservoir sandstones because this is where it was first developed, uh, would give us slightly different values of the bubbling pressure. These are just the, the drainage, water drainage curve, pushing in water into a reservoir to um, drain out the water. Uh, no, this is, uh, th this is, I guess you'd come down this way, right? You start off with oil in your reservoir, and you'd be pushing in... Um, pushing in water, going in this direction, to be able to push out the oil. And depending on the particular geometry of the pore space of the sandstone, they have different characteristics, different irreducible saturations of the water, and different entry pressures across here. And so we'd expect them to be somewhat different. And so certainly uh, the Leverett function is an idealization, but it's actually quite a useful one to some of the things we might want to do. The other 
thing that we might want to do is we might want to generalize this in a way that we could use um, to describe some parameters that describe some features of the aquifer. And those features might be whether it is a very low or a very high entry pressure. In other words, where it's very easy to get fluids into the system or not. And also whether the shape of this bottom of the curve is really flat, which you'd think would mean that all the pore diameters are roughly the same. So as soon as you get into one, then it fills up all the other ones which are the same diameters. Or if it was quite steep, I suppose you'd think that there are small ones, and then there are larger ones, and larger ones, and larger ones. Uh, and it invades the biggest ones first, and then progressively it invades the smaller and smaller ones as you go higher in pressure. And so those features of a, a reservoir or an aquifer might be what we'd like to also explore. And so what we can do is by using this relationship or that was developed by uh, Brooks and Corey, uh, not in petroleum engineering, but in agricultural engineering. So people who work in soil physics, uh, which is often related to agronomy, are interested in getting water into the subsurface to feed crops. And so hydrology is one discipline which we draw on. Petroleum engineering is one discipline we draw on in this class. And soil physics and agronomy is another one. Typically, they're working in the Vado zone, where it's partially saturated. Uh, and so this, obviously, is an important component. They weren't interested in oil and water, but they were interested in water and air. So those are the two fluids. Water is a wetting fluid. Air is the non-wetting fluid. And so we've said nothing in our characterization other than saturation of a wetting fluid, water, and saturation of a non-wetting fluid, which goes in the opposite direction. This is the curve that we've had for our drainage curve before. And this would be the imbibition curve. But let's assume we just work with the drainage curve. So what we could do is we like, like to take this plot, which we've already looked at, uh, in terms of the ordinate of the bubbling pressure and the irreducible saturation of water and draw it in a slightly different way, which might be useful, for instance, in using numerical models. So what we could do is we could take this saturation of water and do something to it. We could subtract from that the irreducible saturation of water. So in other words, instead of working with this diagram, low battery, oh dear me, we could just cut We could just cut it off here, and we could have a saturation here of 0 and 1. And if we change the diagram to do that, that's essentially what we've done by this. Then we could divide this whole term by this length, which is now 1 minus SW0. Right? This length here is actually this term on the denominator. And so really this effective saturation is just the saturation that runs between a 0 here and a 1 here, instead of being 0 here to 1 here. So now we, all we've done is we've cut off a portion of the curve. To allow you, I'm just going to plug in. And... So we've reduced the width, if you like, of the <laughs> There was one here. Ah, oh, there it is. There's one on the wall. <laughs> so all we've done is reduce the width, if you like, of the um, of the graph here. And so it looks a bit different. So our, our graph now looks like uh, this. And now what we could do is instead of plotting, so now it's plotted effective saturation and capri pressure. We could, all, we could now, for instance, divide this through by the unit weight of the, the fluid, 
the water. So this is a pressure divided by um, a pressure divided by a length. So this actually ends up being a length. This is the same as h h sub c kind of. And then plot this term, this modified capillary pressure, and this effective saturation. Take the logs of them and plot the same graph. That's all. And so if we plot this graph as this, where we've just made it into a log-log graph, and the effective saturation that was on the bottom is now on the side, and the cap modified capillary pressure, which was on the side, is on the bottom, is now defined as this. And so we've taken this curve, and it plots as a straight line with an ordinate. And so what you could do is you could think about rotating this 90 degrees so that this was the, I guess this is the y-axis, right? And this would be the x-axis. And you could write this as a curve that in log terms, this is um, y is equal to x0 plus mx. What do you use in the US to describe the equation of the line? This is the UK version. Right? Equation of a straight line. This is the intercept, this is the gradient, and this is the vertical ordinate. And so now it's just defined in terms of this bubbling pressure. This is this, this point here. This is the slope of this. It happens to plot in a straight line. And so it's exactly the behavior that we talked about before. PB is the bubbling pressure. The pressure you have to apply to push a bubble of this stuff uh, through the largest diameter pore throat that exists in your system. And lambda is the slope of this. So the slope of this could be really shallow, like this, or it could be really steep, like this. And so this says that if it's shallow, in which case lambda would be um, big. So that lambda's large in this particular case, high gradient. So I'll try and draw that as a lambda large. This is for lambda small. Horrible, isn't it? <laughs> you can agree with me. And so this behavior would be something where all the pore throats are roughly the same size. You invade the biggest one, then you invade all the others as well, because they're almost as big. In this case, all the pore throats are very different sizes. You invade the biggest one, but then there's lots of much smaller ones, and even smaller ones, and even smaller ones, and even smaller ones that you have to increase the pressure up to, to be able to invade. And so it's just a way of being able to write the, an equation for the particular uh, relationship we have. And it turns out to be this. The effective saturation is equal to the capillary pressure that you apply divided by the bubbling pressure, PC0, this PB here. And this is just the equation of a straight line. So I suppose this would be kind of PB. Uh, plus, is it lambda? I guess that's the gradient times um, SE, is that right? Equals SE, except these are logs, right? Because it's on a log-log plot. But that's basically it. The effective saturation is equal to the bubbling pressure plus lambda times an effective saturation, right? A length down here and a height up here. This term here would give you that. So it's nothing more than that. So it's a convenient way to be able to write that, and it turns out to, to look like this. Yeah, this is it. Effective saturation is equal to lambda, the gradient, times um, the capital pressure magnitude um, plus the value of the intercept, because of log, log term. And so if you looked at that, that's exactly what you see here. So this is a useful graph to see because it shows you this kind of laid out as it would be. So the, on the left-hand side are the curves as you'd expect to see them. We just zoom in to see what they are. 
So what would be the characteristics of these physical curves? This would be, have a big diameter, this would be a gravel, maybe, because it's got a large diameter holes in it, and so the, the fluid can get into it easily. This would be a smaller diameter uh, material. This, once you invade it, you can invade the whole sample very easily. So these would be pore spaces, which would be roughly the same as each other, quite large. And this would be a smaller pore space, and these would be progressively much smaller pore space as well. So this would be what would be referred as broadly graded, a whole bunch of different diameters, the pore throat sizes. This would be roughly the same. And the idea is that now, if you take these same data on the left-hand side, and you plot them as log logs, then you end up with this term here. And if I can show them both at the same time, this intercept here would be this one, low pressure. Uh, one would be the one which goes off from that, which is this, which you see is here. Two would be, two and three are roughly the same entry pressures, right? So they both have the same entry pressures on here as they do. So they both come out of here. But the characteristics are that two is all the same size pores. And so once you invade one of them, you invade all of them. So this is the one that you're on for number two. Three would be once you invade it at the same value, then you have to increase the pressure much more to fill up all these little pores, which is this one here. And finally, the one with the largest entry pressure would be the smallest grain size. So this might be a sand or a gravel, this might be a clay. And once you've invaded it, you have to increase the pressure a lot to be able to invade the smaller pore spaces as you go through here. So it's canted over closer to the horizontal. And that, that's it. And so that's probably really all I want to say. Uh, uh, we, we can start off with this next time because we're running short on, well, we're not that short on time, but we're short enough. So the main point today, the message before you start shuffling around is that we can start off with these capillary pressure tubes, capillary tubes. They give us only one thing. They give us some information about where on this curve the uh, entry pressure would occur, and that's fine. It says nothing about the shape of this curve. If we look at um, realistic soils that have lots of different diameter pore spaces, we know that we'll have these kinds of curves, and they're quite complicated because they're limited by these characteristics, which are that they have um, an entry pressure, they have a drainage component, they have an imbibition component, they have limiting values of the amount of water that you can get out of the system, the amount of NAPL that you can get into the system or out of the system, and also by the complexity of these scanning curves. And so what we'd like to be able to use these for is if within our column where we have this very complex architecture that describes exactly what our um, column looks like, if we can define at any point whoops, the form of the, the depth, the pressure at any particular depth, we should be able to say something about what the saturation is at that depth. Immediately we have a picture of what that would look like in terms of these schematics of funicular versus pendular saturation that we talked about last time. And it should give us some clues about what the architecture might look like in situ, given the geology we know, and how we might go about getting out of it, and how much stuff we might have to take out. So that's it.